Good morning, everyone. It's good to um, have us all gathered together. Uh, we have an agenda today that might be truncated a little bit. We were noticed from the Department of Education that they would like to visit with Montana at 930 today. So some of the individuals that we have on the agenda are going to be uh, in a discussion over Esser and Ian's. Um, the COVID dollars. So good morning again. Um, I'm going to jump right into it. Uh, I've got Deputy Allen here and she's going to give us an overview regarding the chapter and the chapter discussion. And I want to say thank you again to the Board of Public Ed. It's been 13 months since we asked the board for some flexibilities in reviewing what uh, we can aid schools uh, in, the, in the reflection of what happened with the virus, but more importantly, on better serving our students. So, Cheryl. Thank you. It's good to be with you. And let me start with a, a big thanks to uh, folks on this call today that have been actively involved in the chapters and Chapter 57's task force uh, completed uh, their recommendations last week. I'll start with that. And that revision work is under legal review at this time. And then those recommendations will be presented to the state uh, superintendent. Uh, we'll be looking for a special CISPAC meeting in early November to update that uh, subcommittee of the Board of Public Ed working towards those superintendent recommendations to the Board of Public Ed. So, um, some really tremendous work done uh, by that particular task force and we'll be thrilled to be able to share more details at our next meeting. Uh, chapter 55, we're working to get that task force underway. Uh, again, ensuring there's diverse representation. It requires negotiated rulemaking and an economic feasibility study. So a revised timeline will be reviewed with the Board of Public Ed at their November meeting and we're anticipating a hybrid approach uh, with the accreditation revisions. I know I've got uh, Zach Hawkins, who has been one of our co-chairs on 58 uh, on, the, on the call with this. So Zach, I'll turn it over to you for 58. Thanks, Cheryl. Morning, Zach. Good morning. How's everybody doing? <laughs> well, well, good to be here today. Happy, happy Tuesday. Uh, yeah, just a quick update on Chapter 58. Uh, kind of where we left off was there was a request uh, for some analysis and research uh, between uh, subchapter four of uh, Chapter 57 
and some of the proposed uh, recommended changes uh, to uh, subchapter six and seven of 58. Uh, so I'll be working on that uh, and getting that out to the chapter 58 task force folks this week. Um, and then we will resume um, our meetings. We've kind of taken a break the last couple of weeks. We'll resume our meetings on the 28th and um, you know, see uh, what those ramifications might be with regard to uh, any recommendations in six and seven of chapter 58. And um, that timeline will be presented to the board of public ed uh, in the November meeting. Excellent. Any questions you might have of Zach regarding 58 or anything for Cheryl regarding 55's opening or 57? Hey, Elsie, can I just ask a clarifying question? Of course. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so just so I understand this correctly, it sounds like you guys are going to ask for a special SISPAC meeting early November. Is that going to be for 57 and 58? That will be for 57. 57 is the one that has completed their process at this time. Great. And then sounds like 58 will have a revised timeline that will be at the board. So the board will potentially see revisions to 57, um, have a conversation about those, and then see a revised timeline for 58. Perfect. Yep. Yay. <laughs> Great. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, McCall. And I know in putting agendas together, the amount of time and everything, how much time do you think would be uh, granted toward this, Cheryl? I believe that when you have your recommendations, I'll probably, I'm going to guess, want to spend probably a good hour on 57. There's there's substantial recommendations there. And of course, open it for public comment. I think that is exceedingly important with any change that um, is needed in any of the chapters. Excellent. Any other further questions? Great. I see Mr. McCracken, you're on. Uh, is there anything that you believe that our policymakers in November might need at their meeting regarding any of these additions or flexibilities that are offered with 55's opening 57 or 58? Uh, can I think about that? Of course, of course. And again, it's coming to setting an agenda. All right, thank, thank you. you, thank you. Let's go ahead and if, if there are any other further questions, we'll move on. Uh, Mr. Kirksey, if you'd like to go ahead and share your screen with your update on ESSER. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Hope you're doing well today. Uh, just wanted to give an update on where we're at with uh, ESSER funding. And so uh, first, I'll kind of walk you through uh, the chart. Uh, this is, uh, the, the, you'll be seeing this every month as we go on along. Um, but just want to, first of all, uh, kind of explain the different columns that you're looking at. Uh, the green column is ESSER 1, and the reason it, that is green is because uh, we're talking about actual expenditures, actual dollars spent. Uh, ESSER 2 and ESSER 3 will talk about dollars spent, but we'll, we'll look more at how um, uh, funds have been budgeted because those, um, those grants were uh, just submitted at the 1st of September, and so there isn't as much spending activity out of those funds yet. So, uh, so out of out of ESSER one, we had uh, three hundred and five uh, districts and systems uh, across the state uh, apply. Um, a total allocation of just over forty million dollars. Um, and to date, um, uh, about uh, just about thirty million dollars has been spent by districts. And so. Um, and then you'll see below is uh, this is where uh, this is this is kind of where mo the money has been going. So 51% of that funding uh, went towards uh, educators, whether that was hiring specialists, uh, particularly in ESSER 1, we saw um, uh, 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 an investment in uh, technology support services as uh, schools 
got geared up to provide remote learning. We also saw um, a lot of activity um, in uh, increasing kind of custodial staffs as well as health and wellness staff um, to help uh, mitigate uh, virus spread. Uh, and then you can see the breakdowns from there. 40% uh, was the next largest chunk of that uh, $30 million. Um, and that uh, was spent on uh, uh, technology uh, as well as PPE. And so, and then you'll see the others were uh, rel relatively small. Uh, uh, and just, just to note here um, that we still have about $10 million to draw down. Um, and just over 10 months to do that in the state of Montana. So um, uh, those funds have to be obligated by the 30th of September, I guess 11 months, um, the 30th of uh, September, and then be fully expended by the 10th of November, 2022 for SR1. So scroll back up and we'll look at uh, SR2. Um, so it came out of the second round of uh, federal COVID relief. Uh, to date, we have 310 applications. Uh, 284 of those have been approved. Uh, I'm all caught up. And so if they're not approved, it's because they're back in the school district's court um, to make some changes and finalize their submission. So, um, but we are all caught up on applications and amendments. Um, uh, let's see. And uh, total allocation there uh, to uh, LEAs with uh, about 92% of them uh, submitting budgets. The total allocation was uh, just over 160 million. Uh, to date, we have about 100, and schools have about 140 million of that committed. Um, and they've just started spending uh, down uh, SR2 to the tune of about $20 million. Um, and you'll see some shifts in, in, uh, in how funds are being used in ESSER 2 and ESSER 3. And now we're talking about how schools have budgeted their, budgeted their dollars. Um, so that's why the column change, the color has changed. Um, so about 46% uh, spent on staffing uh, and particularly uh, a lot of, um, in ESSER 2, a lot of investment in paraprofessionals and uh, specialist um, and and then also um, uh, a deeper investment in counseling support services um, so um, and then uh, you'll see sort of a shift in supplies um, where uh, technology is still a significant um, uh, significant item that schools are budgeting for. But there's also um, a lot of budgeting for new curriculum and enhanced curriculum and particular curriculum that's versatile for an in-person and a virtual um, uh, delivery formats. Um, probably the biggest jump you'll see is in the property and property services line. Uh, the uh, vast majority of this is going to HVAC replacements and upgrades, but there's also facility renovations that are helping um, uh, schools provide better social distancing, better air quality, um, uh, and, uh, and things of that nature. nature. You'll remember that all the ESSER dollars have to meet um, the core requirements to prevent, uh, prepare, or respond to COVID-19. So, and in ESSER 3, um, uh, which uh, we still have schools that, <laughs> Even though our application uh, deadline has come and gone and been ex extended and that is gone, we still have schools that we're working to get through the process. Um, right, uh, we expect as many, we expect 307 school districts to actually do uh, their ESSER application. Uh, to date, we have 270 of them. So 307 submitted district plans, which is a requirement uh, to, um, to receive SR3 funds. So that's why we will all work pretty targeted with uh, those schools that we haven't heard from uh, within the next month and a half and see and, and get everybody in. So 
So 270 applicants of those 226 approved uh, were fully caught up there too. So um, uh, no, uh, no ap applications are sitting there waiting for, uh, uh, for me, to, me to review. Um, and so we have 74% of total applications, total allocation uh, just shy of $350 million. Uh, to date, we have about three hundred or two hundred and sixty-seven uh, million dollars budgeted, um, but you can see uh, spending has just barely started. Um, schools have just barely started to draw, start drawing down funds from from SR two, and and part of that is because these are stair stepped in the length of time that these funds are available. So we're get, they're gonna. I try to use all their SR1 funds first and then SR2 and then SR3. So um, staffing, um, where we're seeing some new movement with SR3 on the staffing front, staffing is still the largest percentage of the funding is going towards staffing. Uh, we are seeing uh, some work um, here on educator retention and support, um, but also um, uh, a lot of development in uh, summer, programming and uh, after school programming. Uh, in supplies curriculum is uh, is now topping technology, um, still buying technology, but um, uh, particularly as schools uh, try to meet lost instructional time uh, needs, um, they're investing in flexible curriculum. And then property and uh, property services are holding steady at about 30% of funding. Still a lot of HVAC, HVAC um, and air quality uh, upgrades that still seems to be the main, main focus there. So, so um, I'll take any questions you have uh, uh, about ESSER. Um, and I think I'm also, I, I don't think, I know I'm also giving the EANS update today too, because my colleague uh, Janie ha, ha, is uh, in a meeting with the Department of Education, so. Thank you, Jeff. And if you could also give a little bit of a window uh, for uh, a pocket of dollars that is coming for after school oh, yeah. and for summer school as well. We put yeah. together a steering committee um, yeah. of, great, uh, of great people across our state. Uh, in, in looking to see exactly how we can better serve students in a community overview. So Jeff, if you want to lead into that, that would be great. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, it, so if you'll recall, um, through House Bill um, uh, 632, um, the, uh, the legislature actually uh, designated a portion of ESSER funds to go towards after school initiatives, and it was $3.8 million. Uh, so the superintendent, um, uh, established a steering committee of um, of after school leaders ac across the state, um, uh, and they geographically as well as population <laughs> pockets, um, a pretty diverse group of of experts. Um, I worked really closely with them, uh, myself and my uh, colleague Barb Quinn, uh, who's our school finance manager, uh, through a series of recommendations. Um, uh, to make those funds uh, available, um, both to schools and nonprofits um, that want to um, uh, really have an impact on their students uh, through providing uh, meaningful after school activity. And so we are about ready to launch that grant. Um, if all goes as planned, we will launch at the end of the week. <laughs> um, and. Uh, and uh, we'll uh, put out a press release, um, we'll have a website, um, and then we also have, uh, and then we'll send out some direct uh, communication uh, 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 through the Montana After School Alliance. We'll, uh, we'll be helping us get the word out um, as well as we'll be uh, updating our, our educator and nonprofit content. Ah, constituencies across the state. So, um, but that makes $3.8 million available over three years. And, uh, and it is, it's not a competitive grant. It is a formula uh, based grant um, uh, that looks at uh, several different things, including um, uh, the number of students served, 
the, um, the geographical location and population density of areas just to make sure that we're getting good um, resources available to both our students that are uh, in our uh, Montana urban communities as well as uh, our rural communities. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and so uh, that will be uh, kind of first come first served, um, uh, but it is a formula grant. So, so stay tuned for that. We'll, uh, we'll be blitzing out information on that uh, later this week. Thank you, Jeff. Any questions on ESSER or the after school or summer school program? Okay, so uh, Jeff, if you could go into the EANS. EANS is for our non-public uh, partners that we have across our state. And this is what the federal discussion is at this point. So Jeff? Sure. So just a rundown of, of where, uh, where we're at uh, with uh, EANS 1. So uh, we had a total allocation uh, to, this, uh, to the state of uh, just about $13 million. Um, 200,000 of that was set aside for administrative purposes. And then uh, that left um, uh, about 12.6 million. Uh, to push out towards private non and non-public uh, institutions. So uh, as, of, uh, as of today, we have distributed uh, uh, 300 or three million uh, $256 and 55. <laughs> you know what I, you can read it. I don't have to read it for you. Um, so uh, about $3.3 .3 million. Um, and at this point, um, it, it's looking like uh, approximately about $9.4 million of that will uh, revert back to um, uh, the governor's office and become GEARS funds. Um, we're actually in a conversation right now uh, with the Department of Education to get some further clarity on that. That's why you get me giving this report and not Janie Solomon. Um, uh, so total expenditures to date, um, is uh, just right around three hundred and seventy thousand dollars. So, um, and then the breakdown of that, um, uh, kind of the largest percentage of those uh, funds are going towards computers, textbooks, curriculum supplies. Um, about twenty eight percent towards professional technical services such as tutoring or online courses, uh, and. Um, 2% towards um, other equipment like printers or uh, cleaning, uh, cleaning equipment, and another 2% for activities uh, related to COVID uh, preparation or response. So, um, I, and then a couple things. Uh, so that's EANS 1. EANS 2, uh, just to- Jeff? Yes. Could I ask a question? This is Nancy Hall from the budget office. So you've got down here that 3 million, 3.2 million was distributed and 369,000 is expended. So I'm assuming 3.2 million has been awarded. Yes, that's correct. And, and only 369 because it's a reimbursement situation, correct? Or a pay for services. You're right. Yep. Okay. That's exactly right, Nancy. Thank you. Yep. So yeah, so uh, disbursement uh, could, uh, probably the better word would be allocated. So, um, so uh, or awarded. Um, uh, so that has what, that's the number that's been applied for and awarded. And then uh, the 370,000 is what has been expended. So, uh, and you'll remember in, in EANS 1, um, expenses uh, can be uh, reimbursements as well as procurement. Um, uh, and that's different in uh, mm -hmm. EANS 2. EANS 2 is solely procurement. And so, uh, so let, let's talk a little bit about EANS 2. Um, here, are the, here are the federal uh, totals we're working with. So we're looking at just shy of $12 million that would be available 
um, uh, to our private non-public um, educators across the state. Um, the application for EANS 2 is being designed and it'll be ready uh, for applicants by the end of this month. Uh, the application includes a short survey. That survey will identify if a school qualifies under the guidance for the ESSER 2 funds. Uh, the funds are limited to non-public schools that enroll significant percentages of students from low-income families and are most impacted by COVID, uh, the COVID-19 emergency. So a, a significant poverty, le a poverty level will be based on uh, free or reduced uh, school meal guidance and must be at 40% uh, at poverty or above to qualify. This, um, at the school or homeschool must also uh, be physically located in one of the 56 counties most impacted by COVID-19. And uh, they're actually using uh, infection uh, rates to determine that. So, um, so that uh, uh, information will uh, be rolling out at the end of the month on that application. Thank you, Jeff. If you can explain, and Nancy, thank you for bringing this up. The difference between EANS 1 and EANS 2 is basically reimbursement versus procurement. So Jeff, if you would kind of explain what does that mean from a government standpoint and what does that look like in a non-public receiving? Yeah, so, um, so well, <laughs> and again, this should be Janie doing this. So I'll do my best, uh, Superintendent, and you can correct me if, <laughs> if, I, if I say anything wrong, because um, uh, Esser is my wheelhouse. So, um, uh, so what this will look like in a procurement uh, model is uh, we're actually looking at uh, contracting a service that will uh, be the procurement ent entity for uh, for these non-public uh, schools. So uh, whereas in ESSER 1, they could make that purchase and if that purchase was allowable, if that was an allowable use, they could be reimbursed uh, with ESSER 2. That has changed and uh, all um, uh, uh, all procurement actually has to be um, administered by the state or the state's designee. And so, uh, so uh, we're in the process of uh, uh, formalizing a relationship there to where we can centralize kind of procurement services through, uh, through one entity. Thank you, Jeff. And of course, this is coming from the federal government. Uh, and so to have them change this from one to another, uh, it's interesting. And of course, if we're talking about individuals that have never really dealt in government before, um, the great relationship that Jeff and Janie have along with Barb, um, it's so important for them to understand what does government mean for accountability purposes. And um, we are in the process right now uh, we've asked the federal government quite a few questions on Ian's, and we did get an office hour or half hour with them today during the same meeting. Some more information can flow to this at this point. And on our education advocates, we do have some non-public entities, so that's why we took this energy and effort to expend. So any other further questions of Jeff at this time? Superintendent, I have one question. I'm just mostly curious. So it looks like Roughly 9.3 million will go back to the governor's office to gear. Do you know, I mean, it's probably too early to say, but do you know what that'll be spent on? Or is there an idea yet? Do you guys have any recommendations? Uh, thank you, McCall. Uh, because that's what we're discussing with uh, the federal government. And just, just to be blunt, the guidance came out after we had determined what methodology we were using so as a result, that's what we're discussing with the federal government right now is to say, can we have an extension so that we can better expend the 9.3 million? If indeed it goes back to the governor's office, it would be up to the governor's uh, to determine uh, under the parameters that is given by the law and by DOE. So we are in that flux time right now, not really knowing where they are, but I do know that we have Nancy Hall on the phone. Nancy, if you wanted to add anything more to this. Thank you, Superintendent. Um, yeah, we're 
in the process because we don't have the official word yet back from OPI as to how much. I mean, we've known it's around $9 million and they're trying to settle that. But we have six months from the time that they were to revert it back to the governor, which was the end of August. So we're a good two months into our six months to get it redistributed. And, and um, we're currently trying to finalize the gear two grants. Um, I have a pile of them sitting on my desk as we speak. And we're in the process of brainstorming what will happen with this Ian's gear one, <laughs> Ian's gear, Ian's one gear funding. Um, because there's the possibility also that we could get the Ian's two gear funding back if they don't get it all um, obligated. And so we could possibly have more gear funds. The gear funds have a little more flexibility as to how those monies can be spent. And so we're trying to come up with um, reasonable ways to distribute or, you know, to get grant applications out and what those will be used for. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nancy. So if you can understand, we're all in flux and it depends on what our regulator, the department is stating. We did get an extension past August in order for us to go in through October with this. And the relationship I believe is really strong between the governor's office, the budget office and the OPI in order to make sure that the dollars do flow to Montanans. So uh, we just need to get a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Hopefully it's a yes from the federal government um, so that we can understand what the role is and the longevity of that would be. So thanks, McCall. Nancy, thank you for that. Any other questions on Esser or Ian's for Mr. Kirksey? Jeff, thank you. I appreciate you filling in for it very much. And I appreciate all the work that you're doing. Thank you. Okay, right. we're gonna uh, move. If you'll notice, we have, uh, we have um, Ken Bailey back on the agenda. So Mr. Bailey has uh, determined to come back to the OPI for a short term as we are working through so many um, issues with the new influx of the federal dollars and making sure that the state of Montana is accountable with everything that we flow out from our agency. So he has a general fund overview, but he's also in that meeting with the department. So we're gonna move that overview until the next education advocate meeting to really discuss exactly uh, where the state general fund is and where we are with the OPI in the disbursement of the dollars. I do know that uh, at this point, we have received um, all counties but one uh, when it comes to making sure that we've got uh, the ability to see what their levy plan can be. And then we can go ahead and publish that um, in our OPI bud. And then that means then that um, the budgets are set. Any of the ESSER dollars can flow to any increase in enrollment as well. And uh, more discussion from Mr. Bailey will happen next month. But let's move into, we have Dr. Bayless here. He's gonna share with you about the um, assessment pilot that we're working on with the company of Metametrics. And the dollars that we're using are the dollars that were um, granted of the ESSER ability um, through the legislature. So Dr. Bayless, share with us where we are. Absolutely, good to see everyone here today. Um, let's share a screen real quick. Can you all see my, yep, all right, there it is. Um, so this is the uh, Metametrics development uh, and the Metametrics uh, development and the Metametrics program that we're working on. The purpose of the Metametrics pilot is we're trying to uh, reduce the burden of state mandated assessments on local districts. And to do that, we're piloting a program right now with a company called Metametrics. The overall uh, position of the program in its current state is uh, we have it up on the website. It's all functioning there. Uh, we have completed a webinar for various administrators around the state that's also available on the website so that anybody who's interested in the material can go and look at it. Uh, there's a requirement for 1,500 students per grade per test in order to conduct our feasibility study. So the pilot study is in order to determine feasibility for 
this going forward in terms of presenting it to the federal government as an alternative to the current uh, SPAC testing mandates that we use in the state of Montana. Well, let's see, uh, Scott Marion is working with us and Metametrics in order to prepare for that. Uh, that's going to be next year at the soonest is putting together our defensibility strategy. And so right now we're working on content mapping, policy documentation, and working on the federal strategy for defensibility for this program. Um, in terms of the available tests, right now, uh, NWA maps, we have the minimum student numbers necessary in order to begin drawing data. Uh, we're also working on STAR and we're working on the SPAC Interim Cons Comprehensive Assessments, the ICAs. Uh, both of those are pending right now. We're trying to work with Metametrics in order to isolate districts that have uh, minimum student quantities in order to use these and then get them on board before the testing period in February. Right now we have 30 participating districts. So in terms of our timeline of action, uh, it initiated with contacting districts over the summer to uh, be a survey in order to gauge interest and determine which districts were more likely to join the Metametrics pilot. We then followed up with those districts to confirm the interest and we lost a few there. Um, uh, then we provided uh, that contact information to Metametrics who are in the process of receiving MLAs and survey forms back from the various districts, uh, which is why we're currently have 30 participating, but we don't have 30 that have been fully signed up and fully onboarded through the paperwork. And once the district signs the MLA, then Metametrics draws that data from the, from, from the vendor in order to uh, begin their data analysis. And their data analysis is going to be a comparative study based on the final assessment that's given at the end of the year by state mandate under SBAC. Um, and then we're going to be performing a feasibility analysis and preparing for the federal statistical defensibility. So we're going to have to be able to defend this to the federal government if we're going to be able to go forward with the, uh, with the development of the Metametrics program. And if we go to the next slide, uh, these are the districts that are currently participating. Uh, these are those that have confirmed their participation. We're still working on getting all the paperwork in from them. And between all of them, we have 1,500 in NWA maps. And we're still working on getting our numbers up for STAR. And we're still working on getting our numbers up for uh, the SBAG ICAs. So the ICAs right now are sort of the focus. We've, we're pulling data right now to determine which uh, school districts are going to be most effective there. Thank you, Trina. And any questions you might have for Dr. Bayless? You know, we're really excited about this and Montana's leading the way on this. One of the things that is happening in Nebraska at this point is they've taken one of the tests and they are going to do the same thing, but they're using one test um, and allowing then that vendor to be the statewide test um, and then aggregate it over the point of the year to show the growth model that we're doing. What we are doing in Montana, though, offers the choice of the district to be able to determine what is best for them rather than having it being a one vendor test like what we currently have mirrored with um, SBAC. I have been in discussions with Smarter Balance because if you'll notice, we're also using the Smarter Balance interims. And when COVID hit back in March, we were in the middle of uh, our assessment period in 2020. But what we had done in the very beginning of when our test window opened, uh, the start of the year of 2020, we had encouraged school districts to be able to use those interim tests at a, at, um, a benefit to them because the data came back to them quicker. The data came back over skill analysis as well. So we have a lot of districts that are using that interim SBAC and it's paired then with uh, the summative test at the very end. But a lot of work has gone behind the scenes. One of the things that I do wanna say and champion these school districts that you see on here, there are others that we're communicating with. The school district is doing nothing except having their normal test in that formative view uh, being tested at that level. The data is retrieved from the vendor. So it is not giving any more to the school district. And then the districts that do um, are part of the pilot are going to be getting a different uh, metric and a different view back on what the tests look like to help them and encourage them on moving forward for growth 
in the learning of the skills. One so of the, any questions that you might have? Trina. The, I was going to say one of the strong benefits of the Metametrics program is that it provides useful growth data for students. So you have an initial uh, assessment score and you have the final assessment score rather than the end of year assessment that's given the current data state level through SBAC. And the ability to measure student growth in various districts is going to be highly beneficial both in terms of state data and in terms of the district having that data available to themselves uh, during the course of the school year. So we'll be able to do something like measure, uh, measure initial and final uh, student scores against each other in order to determine not only which districts score best on the which districts score best on the uh, the current uh, end of year assessment, but which districts have improved the quality of their education provided for students the most over the course of their school year. Thank you, Trina. And just to, just to share, this is not a, any kind of multiple more testing. The summative test with Smarter Bounce will still be given this year. Um, and I'm assuming next year as well, because for the defensibility of this, we're going to have to do probably multiple years in this pilot. So moving forward then, um, it's important that we do reflect that the assessment, the summative assessment will still be continued. And our assessment unit is working uh, quite diligently with our test coordinators for the efficacy of that test. But again, folks, if we do nothing um, and we uh, say nothing, then that means that uh, Montana um, is, doesn't have that vision. I believe these school districts and the others that are behind that are waiting in the wings, we all have that vision on growth model, on making sure that that education value is in that year period of learning and especially understanding what happened because of the opportunity of learning loss this last uh, school year and the last 15 months that we've done uh, education in Montana. So we're excited and uh, we've got our TAC meeting, our technical advisory meeting that is happening this week as well to visit with our great psychometricians that we've brought in across the United States to have a review of this as well as uh, what Dr. Bayless talked about with making sure that we are going to defend moving forward um, how we can um, better show uh, that students are learning in Montana. So any other further questions for Dr. Bayless? Thank you. I do see in the chat box, we've got a couple of them before we go ahead and close out today. Um, Pad, you're talking about the Legislative MARA Committee that NCSL, which I served on their executive board when I was a legislator, is going to be uh, presenting again on the no time to lose. And if I can understand this, Pat, this has to deal with, um, is it more of an international study or is it, a, is it just um, the 50 states plus the four territories? Uh, good morning, everybody and superintendent. Um, yeah, and I just, and I just uh, sent the links to both the no time to lose report as well as that MARA committee, which is uh, a fiscal committee chaired by Representative Jones, and it was at his request that NCSL is going to give this presentation again. Um, sorry, Superintendent, your questions. Oh, it's so it's it was an international comparison. They looked at the high performing countries around the world for several years and then said, boy, you know, here are the common characteristics that we see in the high performers. It's not a one size fits all by any means, but there are these kind of common characteristics uh, that, that seem to weave throughout all the different uh, successful systems around the world. Um, so yeah, I, I, NCSL has given this presentation to the education committees a time or two, as well as during legislative week in uh, 2020, I believe. Um, so just a heads up, kind of save the date. Thank you, Pat. Always nice to give you homework in a Zoom meeting, huh? <laughs> Thank you. And Jewel, you also had a question regarding Chapter 57 and that uh, there would be a um, understanding of that the task force is going to meet again to discuss the final recommendations 
and to crosswalk between chapter 58. Um, I don't have a date set at this point. I'm, it, it is uh, Deputy Allen that's leading this. Um, but at this point, uh, we will ask the question and it can come back in the reflections when we send the information that was here today uh, in your email as well as the recording. So if you had anything else, Joel, to ask on that, I'd be more than happy to listen. No, I thank you very much. I just think that the task force was interested in reconvening once the crosswalk had been completed to make sure that um, we had taken everything into consideration and that there aren't any gaps between the two and that we're thoughtful and thorough when we do make our final recommendations. So thank, thank you for that. Thank you, Joel. I appreciate that. And thank you for participating with this. There's many more uh, that are on the screen. So with that, um, we are going to go ahead and adjourn. Um, I don't know, uh, McCall, if you have anything to say from the Board of Public Ed, if you'd like to at this point, or anyone else, uh, Dr. Miller, or anyone, uh, Mr. Parman, if you would like to, uh, anyone from any of the other Montpec partners, we'd be more than happy to. Thanks, Superintendent. I don't have anything to share necessarily, but um, once you guys do figure out when you'll need that special meeting from CISPAC, it'd be great to know. As you know, they're a group of education professionals, so they're all mostly in the classroom. So as soon as we can figure out that special date, um, the better, so I can give them as much notice as possible. Excellent. Thank you, McCall. Okay, well, I very much appreciate uh, the, the convening today. Lots of work to do. It's a beautiful Tuesday. Thank you all. Please stay well.